All right, everyone, I want to get started somewhat on time, uh, keep you guys on schedule for the rest of the presentations and workshops this afternoon. While I will begin, Kabir here will be um, finishing up uh, the presentations that we'll be demonstrating shortly. Um, Kabir has been kind enough to come up from Davis. He's our soil health specialist um, out of the Washington DC office, but they have him located here for on the fly presentations like this. So um, I, I'm excited for Kabir to be here and be able to provide these demonstrations because I think it'll help you uh, be able to see you know, what we mean when we talk about soil health. Um, and talk about different management practices that can help promote soil health in agricultural systems. Let's see, so with that, I'll, I'll begin the presentation and I'll try to remember which button did what and the what now. Um, so just to start off, here's just a general outline. I'm gonna try not to throw too many curveballs at you guys, but no promises. Um, uh, we're gonna begin with some introductions about me, the agency, kind of a general idea of what is soil health, why it matters, um, and why you need to know about soil health, um, and what is one thing that you can do to promote soil health. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you guys are familiar with soil health or soils in general? Yeah. Ooh, yay, I've got all of the overachievers in my class today, so hopefully I, I brought enough uh, material for you guys. Um, you know, it's really hard to try to um, develop presentations on soil science and soil health to general audiences because everybody has a different understanding of soil, um, what it means, people use it for different things. Uh, if you're a farmer or a rancher, you're using it as a, a growing media. Um, if you're an engineer, you're using it as a building construction material. Um, if, you're, if you're a real estate agent, you're using it to help determine property values, things like this. Um, so we'll begin with a little bit about me. I you know, put a whole bunch of stuff in that bio. Born and raised in Las Vegas. Um, so Las Vegas native are pretty hard to come by these days. Uh, it's a very transient town, and uh, in 2009, I came up from Las Vegas to go to, the, to go to Oregon State University and get a degree in crop and soil science, um, where I then began um, in the Pathways program as a student with NRCS, um, and there I was able to gain a lot of hands-on, uh, on-the-job training that helped me to become the MLRA soil scientist that I am. Now, my title is very long and boring sounding. I'm a major land resource area soil scientist for the Redmond Initial Soil Survey. And everybody's eyes kind of glaze over when I give that title, but my job is a lot cooler than that title implies. Um, what I tell people I do is I essentially get paid to road trip, dig holes, draw maps, and look at plants and rocks all day in very remote, gorgeous places. So it's a very uh, interesting gig to be a part of, and um, it's kind of part of a secret society of soil scientists. Um, you know, they're, the reason why people don't know uh, the type of soil scientist I am, I'm a soil mapper, is because you would never find one standing on a stage at an LGBT agriculturalist conference talking to people. Um, we like to literally stick our, whole, our heads in the holes that we dig and we describe, and that's where we live. We live with our heads in holes. Um, so I think I'm part of this new generation of soil scientists who are coming out and trying to interact with uh, the people who use our products to be able to engage and let them know why the science that we study matters. Um, and I think that's just a problem with science in general is being able to come down from the ivory tower, come down from our labs and be able to communicate and communicate that message effectively of why these things matter. Um, so you guys are kind of my uh, beta testers. You know, I'm kind of first time doing this. This is all um, off the cuff presentation. You know, best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. So in my head, this was all gonna go flawlessly, but as you can see, <laughs> it is just kind of last minute shooting from the hip, but you know, I'm a Vegas gal at heart, so the showgirl must go on. 
Um, and we will we'll kind of continue. And just to kind of lighten things up a bit, I'm going to give you one fun fact about me. Um, you know, talking about how I'm a soil scientist, people wouldn't typically peg me at, as that. But growing up, I actually grew up rodeoing. Um, and so one fun fact there is I grew up roping and goat tying and doing all of those kind of daredevil looking things. And uh, when I was 12 years old, I actually got the uh, arena record for breakaway calf roping a calf in 1.8 seconds. So when you think about 1.8 seconds, all the things that have to come together in that amount of time kind of blows my mind to think that I did that at one point. So if I was able to do that at the age of 12, hopefully I'd be able to carry on with this presentation and give you guys something worthwhile, if not just an amazing train wreck. So uh, buckle up, it's going to be a fun ride. Um, I'm gonna begin with uh, our mission at USDA. Um, we, we pride ourselves in being the leaders in agriculture, conservation, and really just helping people provide them with tools and resources to be able to make smart, effective management uh, decisions on the landscape. Um, we began, uh, we were actually started, uh, Abraham Lincoln named us the, the People's Department. Um, and I, I think that ethos rings true, true today in why we're here at places like Cultivating Change, why you see us out at county fairs, why you see us at universities. We really try to engage with our people um, because you guys are the ones who are actually doing the great work. We are just providing you the tools and facilitating um, your efforts. Um, and you know, in a little bit after me, actually, you're going to hear um, from my other USDA cohorts, and we, on top of just being technically sound and proficient professionals, uh, we also have a soft spot for being inclusive and promoting diverse and welcoming workplaces. So I am actually the LGBT Special Emphasis Program Manager for Oregon. Um, I'm about eight months into this position, so still trying to figure out you know, how this thing works, and I was able to, to get tied into this program and to be able to see why my presence as an LGBT SEPM in agriculture is important. It's be able, is being able to meet with you, hear your stories, hear your perspectives, um, really get a sense from the ground up, you know, what's important to you and how can I help um, bring that message higher up um, into the organization and what I can do to my, for my employees and customers to make them feel safe and included in these conversations that we have around agriculture. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with NRCS, show of hands, fairly familiar. Yes, of course, all my NRCS folks here. Um, so just a brief history, NRCS uh, actually began uh, in 1935 as the Soil Conservation Service. We were born out of the Dust Bowl. Um, and, you know, so we had this huge catastrophic uh, events that were happening around uh, the farm belt in, in the Midwest. And we had a lot of soil loss and erosion and just devastation. Uh, it, just, it just wiped out livelihoods uh, from all over the world and really kind of changed how we interact with the landscape. So from that moment, uh, FDR, as part of his, his New Deal program, he, he thought it was time that we actually inventoried the soils to get an idea of the physical and chemical properties behind them and why some soils are more erosive than others, why some are more limited uh, in growing and productivity than others. And so that's kind of where I began, why, where my program began. We were congressionally mandated to begin the march to start inventorying soils and surveying them from the Midwest all the way to the West. And, uh, you know, Midwest soils, not trying to, you know, talk bad about them, but they're pretty boring. They're pretty flat and they're pretty easy to map. And so, and because that was where the focus was, right? That's the bread belt. That's where, you know, we were really driving a lot of our agricultural productivity. But as we've gone West, things get a lot more complicated. The geology gets insane. You get the Rocky Mountains. You get, you know, the Sierra Nevadas. Where I'm at in Oregon, we have the Cascade Mountains. And they just really turn your world of, of, of how soils and plants operate into a wholly, totally different realm. Um, and so we're still mapping those soils. We haven't even published 
in some areas. So my office, we actually just finished the field work last summer, and so what we're gonna do after 20 years of, of surveying these areas, we're finally gonna enter into the publication process where you guys would be able to then uh, access that information on web soil survey to find out can you put a septic system in these very shallow soils? Can you build a house with a basement? Uh, you know, we really try to drive a, a user experience with our information. So you'd be able to enter in your address, look up, you know, are you on prime farmland? Are you not? Can you build? Can you develop? We try to answer those questions for you. Um, so as we kind of move forward, uh, after the new, deer, uh, new Deal, we have FDR here signing things and he charged all of us to go out and start digging holes. And as you can see by this guy, he's out looking at a road cut in a horse and buggy. Now this is pretty much what I do, but obviously in a Chevy pickup truck and uh, we call this road mapping where you don't even have to dig the hole yourself, you can just use a uh, a road cut and it's pretty easy digging. Otherwise, you know, you have to uh, do things like this. Dig your own dang hole on the side of a very steep, shallow mountain. And it's, it's a lot of fun work, it's a lot of hard work, um, but luckily there's people dumb enough like me to go out and do it for you. Um, <laughs> So, you know, this is just a general breakdown of kind of how I view the world of soils. Uh, when I go out and dig a hole, I describe all of the physical and chemical properties of that soil. Um, and I put it in all kinds of weird shorthand codes that then go into a database um, that then can spit out really pretty reports that you'd be able to make sense of but I kind of look at things in this, this pet-on or this profile level, and then it moves up to the landscape. So once I dig that first hole on a certain landscape position based on a certain relief, on a certain geology, vegetation, I look at all these things and I say, oh, hey, I noticed those similar characteristics over here. I wonder what happens if I dig this hole over here. Will I get the same soil or not? And if I get that same soil over and over again, I begin to develop a repeating pattern across the landscape that then I'm able to draw lines around and say, hey, you know, this concept holds true th to this area, to this alluvial uh, floodplain. You know, I'm, I typically see these types of soils and these types of hill slope positions, and that's how these soil maps are, are based on. So when I said that I go around and dig holes and draw maps, this is really what I'm doing. Um, so I get to get creative with the lines I draw based on photo imagery, based on what I see out in the field. Um, and so this is all my winter work, you know, I get to draw squiggles um, and, and color them and make these nice looking block diagrams to hopefully convey some of that information and those concepts. And as we've kind of gone across in soil survey, we've really nailed down the physical properties. Sand, silt, clay fractions go into the texture. So when you grab a sample of soil or dirt, um, I'm, I'm not one of those sticklers who will, you know, crack a ruler against your knuckles for referring to soil as dirt and dirt as soil. Um, although I, I feel it's important, you should know the difference. Um, you know, so when I grab a, a sample of soil and I wet it up and, I, and I'm feeling for grit, I'm feeling for how smooth and silky it is and because we're out in the field and we're bored and we don't talk to anybody, we kind of get a little intimate with the soil. So when things are getting smooth and silky and I'm like, oh, this is supple, like this is a supple silt, you know, this is a sexy silt, you know, like you kind of, you know, you start kind of playing with yourself a little bit and trying to personalize it um, a bit because I think that's, that's the reason why as soil scientists, we engage with soil at a, a, a much more intimate level. We smell it, we look at it, we break it, we eat it, you know? Like we're just really, you know, getting all up in there um, and then relaying that to you without you having to do all those things. Although I would highly recommend it, you know? It's, it's kind of cool to bite on some sand and, and determine, you know, how easy it was to break in your teeth without chipping a tooth. Um, so, you know, we really have the physical properties down. Um, and then we also have the chemical properties down. From the chemical properties, we look at things like soil pH. I'm sure a lot of you have maybe done a soil pH test in your garden or in your fields. Um, and, and we have, over the years, developed a lot of science behind that. How we tie things like texture 
cation exchange capacity, um, soil pH into concepts known as soil fertility. Um, and from there, we're able to kind of make interpretations. How fertile is this soil going to be? Um, how conductive is it? Does it have a lot of salts in it? You know, is, are the salts from the soil, from the parent material, or are they from the agricultural water that you're using to water your crops? Um, so the chemical stuff we have down fairly well. Um, and so through, through this baseline survey, through this baseline knowledge of the soils in our country, we're able to, to use technology and research by universities and other USDA agencies and BLM and Forest Service, taking their research and condensing it down into science-based solutions. Uh, making sound management decisions on the landscape. And so we have this, this toolbox of, of practices and concepts that then we're able to package into programs and get people to come into our door and say, hey, if you're interested in maybe uh, establishing more in efficient uh, irrigation on your property based on these soils, this is your wetting period, this is how long you need that soil, to, uh, to absorb all of that water. We will pay people, we will help plan, we will pay you to, to, to pursue these plans or to implement these plans. And then through those plans, we develop partnerships. Uh, so we don't just work with private land owners, we also work with soil and water conserva conservation districts. Uh, we work with the Forest Service, we work with BLM to do some of these larger scale initiatives. Some of you out west might be familiar with the Sage Grouse Initiative. Um, and that's, you know, it's an, sorry, it's an unfortunate problem or a program that we have to focus on the sage grouse because it is the dumbest animal that we are trying to protect, protect right now. Like it's trying to kill itself. Um, and we're just spending so much money trying to protect it. But the reason why we do that is because we realize that that little sage grouse, the conditions that it likes to live in, are also conditions that mean that that rangeland is really healthy and happy and it's able to do things like store water um, and provide a diverse plant life. Um, and, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for diversity. We don't want monocultures, you know. We all know like monocultures are, of corn and soybeans are kind of detrimental because you're not adding that biodiversity. Um, we live in a very diverse world and not just above ground but below. You know, we really need to start feeding this idea of the, the more diversity we bring into these systems, the better. Um, and so we're kind of at this paradigm shift where over the, you know, in the past when grandpa, you know, used to farm his soybeans, he would he would plant at a certain time, he would lime at a certain time, and it didn't matter if it needed it or not, he was gonna do it on this calendar date, it was just kind of hardwired into him that, you know, I needed to go out and disc here and now. And every year you started that process and you took, you took things out of the soil and you put them back into the soil. It was just kind of like a checkbook, you know, like I take out X and I'm gonna put in Y and every year I'm just gonna follow that cycle. And so it was very transactional, very impersonal. Um, it, it, all it did was focus on those upper six to 12 inches of the soil. And when you look at some of these soils, they're deep and they're rich and they're sexy and they're gorgeous and it's like body yaddy yaddy for days and you know, you just, you, I just want to, to get people to start thinking a little bit deeper than that because that's really where our, our reserve, our natural resources are actually coming from, is from those deeper banks. Um, and so, you know, this, when we talk about soil health, I think it's this new paradigm shift where we're adding more of the biological element. You know, we have a lot of physical, we have a lot of uh, chemical information and data, but now it's time for us to really kind of get a thumbprint of the biological activity that's going on underground. Um, and NRCS is doing a lot of great things, understanding those, uh, those biomes and those interactions between organic matter and mineralogy and clays and silts and waters and, and, and all of these things. Um, and I just realized that um, I don't have access to click this link, so I'm gonna ask the gentleman in the back if they could click this link and hopefully um, bring up this video without issue. Um, but, so this video is from the Soil Health Institute, which if you haven't been to their website, it is amazing. It is, they are really, 
producing a lot of great content and material that is totally accessible and it gives you that big picture. Why is this important? Um, and, you know, me standing up here talking to you about this, I can only do so much. Um, because I'm a millennial, I like pictures and things that I don't have to read. You know, I like information to be brought to me. Is it good? All right, cool. So we're going to bring it up um, right here shortly. Hopefully it has sound as well. Uh, I hear it. If you think about a really healthy soil, there's about 10,000 oh. pounds of biological material. Where's it going? Soil. Yep. Sorry. You know, obviously these things happen. Uh, so anyway, so the Soil Health Institute is probably the premier source for this information. Uh, NRCS definitely has a very robust soil health program. Um, you know, just having people like Kabir now in our field offices is proof that we are focused and we are dedicated to really integrating soil health into, um, into our management systems. And if we could expand that. Soil and oh, never mind. I, we can't do that. Um, they embedded it weirdly. But go ahead and play. Yeah, can you guys see that? Okay. Okay. Think about a really healthy soil. There's about 10,000 pounds of biological material that are in the soil surface. Or the main thing. Fungi, and Everybody loves those pop-ups. I mean, they always pop up at the most inopportune time. Um, anyways, I thought that was a pretty neat little clip that kind of lets, that shows you just how big uh, the world beneath our feet is. When you think about two African elephants in, in one acre of soil, and how are we going to feed that, those beasts under there? What are we doing to feed that biodiversity and that, that microcosm um, of life and and what are you doing you know as agriculturalists what are you doing at the individual level to feed those animals uh, to feed that life and sustain that diversity um, once the presentation comes back up um, we will we'll kind of look at uh, this world the 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 biology of the soil and it's it's diverse it's full of macro and micro organisms. You've got big critters like voles and gophers and mice and then you've got your little soil engineers, the earthworms, you know, going around and tunneling and, and all that's doing is just bringing the rich organic matter from the top all the way down to the bottom. So the more of those little critters you have bringing that stuff down, the deeper and richer you're making that profile. Um, and so, and then you've got all of the little microscopic guys. You've got fungi, you've got uh, microbes and mycelia that are forming very, very complex um, in integral uh, relationships with each other. You know, we've got uh, 
everybody likes to reference the, uh, the symbiosis that happens between, uh, between fungi and plant roots and the nodules that, that kind of provide a habitat for bacteria that are able to help uh, turn nitrogen into something soluble to plants. Um, it's these kinds of complex relationships that we need to be feeding and we need to be focusing on. And there's several different ways we can do that. Um, see, we get the button here. And you know, when we think about soil organic matter and soil health, there's these bigger issues and these bigger principles and properties that we're trying to bring into play. So there's this little factoid that, did you know that for each 1% of organic matter added, US cropland could store the amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls in 150 days? So think about that when we think about a 1% increase. You know, what are we doing to help add that 1% increase to our soils to help bring that much more water and save that much more water? We're in California right now. We're in an area that has been devastated by drought. Um, what are our farmers doing to help promote just that little bit of organic matter in that surface to help make things richer and help drive these functions and these processes to their full potential? And, uh, and so this is where we kind of talk about what practices you can do to promote soil health. What are the concepts? Um, how many of you out there are familiar with some of these soil health principles? Most of you guys. Some of it is kind of intuitive. You're like, well, duh, you know, duh, if I, if I shade the soil from being baked all day, you know, it's not going to be, you know, Kentucky Fried crazy, like by the time I try to plant something into it. Um, so, you know, we're going to, through some of these demonstrations, hopefully try to tie what you're looking for when you're promoting um, soil health and soil tilth. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start with, uh, I think, the sponge demonstration. Uh, Kabir's going to have to walk me through some of this. This is his, his routine that I am just kind of hijacking. Uh, so, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I just, to kind of tie into to the idea of, of soil as a, as a means to hold water, and it's a sponge. You know, it's a very active sponge, not only for water, but also for nutrients. Sorry. No problem. I just did a backflip on stage. I'm also an acrobat, you know. I studied Cirque du Soleil growing up. Um, I did this is a small sponge. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, 25% of water and 25% of air. Okay. And also 5% organic matter. But this is another, there's, you know, much bigger than this size, but it has one little small pore. Okay. Inside, but it's holding more water than this one. Right. So, so, big thing. so as you might have heard from Kabir, um, is we're kind of, we're going to try to demonstrate. Yeah. Okay, we are, we're gonna soak in these two sponges, and he was talking about this one being a finer texture soil, and then this one having kind of bigger pores and textures. Yeah, um, so and then we're gonna flip it around and soak it in. Yeah, so you can squeeze it and you know. Get some of that air out. Oh, I see what's gonna happen. Okay, I see what we're doing here. Right. Okay, so we're trying to get all of that air out and get as much water in. So, so this one's bigger and finer textured, and this one's smaller but coarser textured. So what we're going to do is squeeze it in here and without making a mess, but this is science, so it gets messy. <laughs> and we're trying to demonstrate just that the added water holding potential right. of, of this one. So this is, there was a slide that I showed earlier that had 25% air, 25% uh, soil minerals, um, and then organic matter. And so this is the, the composition that you are looking for because just here by demonstrating, you're able to see how much more water this is able to hold. So if you were to add that 1% of organic matter, then you're exponentially increasing this soil's ability to hold water. And there's some crazy statistic and factoid to add to it, but I know it's a lot. It's a lot because when you think about um, organic matter is 
just like clay particles. And even though they're really small, they're like dynamite. They pack a powerful punch in a tiny bit of, of space. So if you were to unpack uh, an organic matter molecule and a clay particle, if you were to unpack that, it would be the size, the same surface area as a football field. So think about all of those little microsites on a piece of organic material all attached to one particle of soil and then how much more water and nutrients you're gonna be able to, to keep into that soil, keep it in place than something that doesn't have that. So that's, that's one. Yeah, yeah, so we're gonna keep this so, show moving, so. Yeah, you just go ahead and these are the two soil, actually, maybe you can show them. Sure, two yeah. Two soil, one is from the conventional tillage, and this is from the no-till system. So all of these soils that Kabir brought over, he actually brought over from the Davis Research Farm. So we've got. From UC Davis. From right. UC Davis. Right. This is like uh, in the uh, Central Valley. Okay. Western side. 18 years of conventional tillage, the standard tillage, only tilling the soil. Sure, every year. And this one is the no-till. Okay. The no tillage has been done and growing crop for 18 years. So as you might have, have seen, we're really trying to promote no-till systems to help reduce compaction and disturbance to the soil. Um, and as you can just see on the physical level, look at, this is the till, this is the no-till. This is the same soil, different management practices. And so like when I'm out in the field uh, describing a soil sample, what I like to do or what we have to do to test the consistency of the soil is sit there and we pop it to determine how many newtons it takes for me to crush this ped. So I'm like calibrated to the newton level. I'm like a, <laughs> I feel like I robot. So what I do is, and this one's really hard, so if I'm out in the field and I'm trying to break this with my finger, um, I would call this extremely hard, which is like greater than 20 newtons, which nobody needs to know except for me because I'm a nerd. But uh, anyway, it's really, really hard. Um, and then if I were to, to do that with this soil, It's kind of hard, kind of dry. Uh, yeah. um, and so out in the field, we do this both dry and wet. So when, when we wet these things up, I'm gonna take a little dunk in this stuff here. Then I've got different consistence. This one pops and it makes like a good pop. And this one, I think it's just too big for me to really wrap my fingers around. Um, uh, and it's too clayey too, so womp womp. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so general idea when we're out in the field, we're kind of measuring these properties for you. And so right now I'm gonna try to demonstrate um, how well these two soils will hold together when water is added to them. Um, so we call this the aggregate stability test. And so as you can tell, the one that's been tilled every single year, it will not hold its structure when water is added. So this is why erosion happens. This is why you lose soil, is because you do not have the same aggregate stability as this one. And the reason why you have more aggregate stability is because you're not tilling it. You're not disturbing those roots. You're not adding air and oxygen to then volatize the, the organic matter and the glues that are binding this, this soil together. And look at it. Look, I mean, look at it go. Like I. I could sit and watch these all day long, and I kind of do in my office sometimes. <laughs> It'll just sit um, and play with different soil pads. But I mean, look at it just crumble. It's, it's kind of interesting to think, all right, so if that's just that little piece of soil, how much, how much that's happening on such a large scale, and that's why we have water quality issues. That's why we have you know siltation issues. That's why everything backs up. We all live downstream, so we're all catching this stuff, and we're all losing all of this vital soil um, downstream. In, in per acre per year, actually 5.2 tons per acre per year soil we are losing. 5.2 tons um, per acre per, per acre year. per year. 5.2 tons per acre per year. That's a lot of soil. Like that's a lot of soil um, that, we're, that we're losing. And so, you know, kind of going back to our roots here, the Soil Conservation Service, we are trying to prevent this from happening because I don't want to wake up one morning to a dust bowl, you know? Like I don't want to have to walk around with 
you know, dust masks and putting them on my dog and stuff, and uh, it would just be a bad, bad situation. So, so right now we, we're going to kind of work our way up to. It's a rainfall simulator. You know, I'll see you can say. Okay. Yeah. There's just some water in here. If some water goes inside, it means it's remaining in the field in filtration. It's running off. It goes uh, here, you know, around our tank. Yeah. So this is two soil actually collected from Full Belly Farm today. Full Belly Farm. Yeah. Okay. This is the organic farm. And this is a no-till, uh, sorry, the, this is the no-till system. With okay. With on top, and this one is just a standard tillage, you know, till the soil right here. Okay, so as you can tell, and kind of caught from Kabir, we have got a no-till and a till system from an organic farm just up the road. He was actually at a demonstration earlier today. Um, so it was nice enough to collect me these soil samples. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna demonstrate what happens when soil infiltrates into, uh, or when water infiltrates into the soil, the difference it makes when you've got root cover, when you've got any kind of coverage on the soil versus not. Um, and so we're gonna be looking at the infil infiltration rates and then also the runoff. Yeah, from the rainfall. From rainfall, just natural rainfall. And typically, we time these to get infiltration rates uh, going. But as you can tell, this one, look at this one. It still has water hanging out at top. This one is, is kind of going down slower. Yeah, so, so as you can tell, this one has a little bit more water that was released than this one. And then, oh, yeah. So then we're looking. This is, you know, this is no water actually going through because of standard tillage. But this one is a no till, so water is infiltrating. Ah, see, did you, did you guys catch some of that? Okay, so, um, so what he's saying is, so when this water came through, that there's actually water ending up in the bottom. So the water is able to soak through the soil that has all of the roots and pores in it, which you want. You want that water coming directly down into the soil profile, whereas this one it didn't because it's so compacted that it's preventing the water from catching in this bottom bucket. And instead of coming down the bottom bucket, it's shooting off. So then that's when you get real erosion. Oh, it, it's a little wonky. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you guys can kind of see here, I, I'm going to make a mess if I move that. But take my word for it that there is more water in this bucket than in the bucket to the right. And so that's what we're doing. We're wanting to increase the soil cover, increase that, uh, that root matter that's then exuding glues and increasing biodiversity in the soil that are able to promote like these more structured and friendly, um, friendly soils than this, which is compacted. Um, you know, I kind of showed with this thing, this is how hard it is. So it's really hard for little tiny seeds and roots to get a start in soils that are heavily compacted like this. And so this is what we've been doing for hundreds of years. This is the type of agriculture that we're trying to undo right now. Um, and I know that there's some limitations to getting into no-till systems, having to totally change your, your implementation, um, change the machines that you're using. You have to go into direct till um, systems and farm, farm implements are not cheap. You know, those are very expensive machines. So maybe you have a really nice neighbor who will come, you know, direct seed your place. But, you know, that's, that's where agencies like USDA and Farm Service Agency and Rural Development kind of come in and help you offset the, the cost of getting into more of these uh, conservation practices. So from just a couple of these demonstrations, we just kind of get an idea of, of why we, we want to keep the soil covered why we want to minimize disturbance and reduce compaction in the soil, uh, why we want to increase crop diversity. So this is just one, 
one crop in here. You know, think if you were to have um, different crops with different rooting depths. I forgot um, I was going to put up a, a big banner, and maybe I'll do it in the engagement center. But it's a really great uh, photo that illustrates the different roots of different plants. So if you were to have large tap roots next to nice fibrous grass roots next to shallow little um, annual crops and plants, if when you increase that biodiversity, you're increasing that organic matter at different depths and they all kind of interact and feed different critters and species and processes. And so, you know, just kind of going back to, to what we've been missing over the years is just understanding these, these intense and complex processes and relationships that happen below ground. So we have things like the carbon cycle constantly happening. We have, we have cows that are eating the grass that are then pooping it out and turning it into organic matter that then sits on the soil that fertilizes it, that goes down, that the, the bugs and critters are able to eat. Um, and it's just one giant cycle. It's one relationship on relationships, just a lot of relationships happening. Um, so these are the things that we need to be mindful of when we're out in the field uh, working. We need to think, what are we doing to promote these processes? Um, because what you're doing on your little plot of land, on your, in your little backyard garden, multiply that times the millions of people that are on this earth. And, and when you think about that, it turns into this landscape model. So what are we doing at each of these points and junctures to help reduce things uh, um, like erosion, runoff, and uh, kind of mitigate any kind of drought or mitigate any kind of effects of climate change? We have to start thinking in this holistic landscape model. And, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what I am on time right now, um, but, oh, I think I'm pretty good. Um, but I was going to go into a little demonstration on how to use uh, the tools that, that we at NRCS develop, which is a uh, web soil survey, which is a very, it's, it's our bread and butter. Um, what I tell people is you're able to go onto the website, enter in your address, and find out the type of soil that you are living on. And whether or not you're using that for agriculture or, you know, maybe you want to to develop your own garden bed instead of a raised bed. Knowing what type of soil you're beginning with is, is the first step to, to sound, mindful uh, agriculture and land management. And so I, I looked up Justin's address here, and he lives in the DC area. And just being able to see you know, where your house lies on this soil map and what it means, where are you tied to that landscape? How are you connected? You know, where are you? Are, are you on a floodplain? You know, are you on a terrace? To me, that's fascinating. Just trying to get an idea of where I stand in the world at any given point in time. And so when you uh, enter in your address or your area of interest, you can find out the soils and their different properties that they have, what their strengths and limitations are. And then you can also pull up reports that let you know the fertility of that soil, the water holding capacity, the available water holding uh, capacity of the soil, all kinds of stuff. And if you're interested, you can stop by the USDA booth and I can give you some brochures and give you a rundown um, and maybe point you in the direction of some of the reports and interpretations that would be um, you know, tailored to you. Oh, wrong button. And, uh, and so, you know, kind of winding down this, this talk right now, and hopefully I've, I've driven home the idea of the importance of relationships and the importance of, of developing diversity below ground and above ground. You know, we need us above ground to be thinking of, of how do we start from the top down? You know, how do we increase the diversity and the people who are, who are working these lands? Uh, who are, you know, going to be preserving these resources for future generations and how we're, we're impacting uh, the world beneath our feet. And, um, you know, I, I think I have just a, a small personal anecdote on, to me on, on the importance of soil and what I think it means uh, to relationships and communities and, and the importance of building those relationships and communities at the human level. Um, you know, when I had first began my internship with NRCS, I came up from, 
from Nevada, and I, I got a phone call one day that you know my mother had fallen ill, and she, I was working on a trail crew out in the middle of nowhere, got this phone call, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And she, you know, I, I'd come back and I was checking my voicemail and I got this voicemail from my grandmother and she said, your mother's sick, uh, your mother is very sick and um, your mother has HIV. And that was the moment that I realized my life was going to change and my eyes are gonna get sweaty and I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, but you know, it's, it's been a couple of years, but to, to think, oh my God, I had to hold on and dig my heels into something real, something meaningful, something bigger than me that was going to help me help others. Um, that, was, that was her mission. That was what she instilled me to do. And for me, um, getting real, real sad girl up here. Um, <laughs> But um, for me, it's soil. Soil is bigger than all of us. And, and it's, the, it's the way that we're gonna be able to help change and influence other people's lives. Um, you know, just talking about soil fertility and soil health, that's one thing, but everybody uses soil. Everybody's impacted by it, everybody uses it. Um, and I think it's, it's the one real vehicle of change that we can use to help bring about a difference in the world. If I wanna use soil to help communities that are being affected by, uh, by food insecurity, I can use soil to do that. If people are, don't have clean water, I can use soil to do that. Communities that are affected by HIV AIDS, um, I can do that. I wanted to figure out a way to play a role in everybody's life because that's, that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I think for me it was getting into soil science, I was able to learn a little bit about everything and therefore be able to engage and connect with people on multiple levels. We have a diversity of background and a diversity of thought, but we all live and breathe thanks to soil. Um, and to just be able to start that conversation with soil, like, hey, hey, do you know the name of your state soil? Do you know the soil that you live on? Just have those conversations, just make that connection. That's literally the common ground we all stand on. And I think the, the sooner we're able to, to recognize that we are all tied by this commonality, by, by this great natural resource, um, the sooner we're able to recognize that everybody uses it, that, that LGBT rights are human rights, that women's rights are human rights, that trans rights are human rights, and we all live and breathe and use the soil, and we all need to protect it and use it and save it for each other and save ourselves. That, that to me is the most powerful thing is to be able to take ownership and agency of the, of the ground that we stand and we walk on and to be able to use that to empower us to help fight the good fight because we all have to stand together on something and I know right now the world is super fragmented and it's kind of an ugly scary place but what I did when I, when I was met with an ugly scary place in a, in a disturbing Re new reality, I dug my heels in and I just kind of took root in the ground that I stood on, literally. Um, and, I, and I want you all to know that you can do the same with soils. You can literally take the, the place that you stand right now and go up and try to figure out how you can cultivate that change from the bottom up. So with that, I thank you all, and I'm gonna go wipe all the mascara <laughs> off my face. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop and, and talk to me. Um, obviously, this is the first time I've ever shared this story in such a professional, open space, but um, it's something that I feel needed to be daylighted because I, it's part of a narrative in this community that affects this community that oftentimes is only met with stigma and shame. And it's not just an LGBT issue, it's a human issue. And we're dealing with human issues at the, at the top. And so we need to figure out how we're gonna approach these things. And it, for me, it's from the bottom up. So thank you. <laughs>